Okay, today we're going to delve more deeply into function behavior. And we're going to start off talking about what we ended up talking about yesterday, which is the importance of the leading term. Now we're going to discover how it's even more important. Remember, it determines end behavior. Well, it determines a lot more than that. OK, the degree of this polynomial is 6. So let's write it out here, degree 6. Here's what that 6 means. It means that the maximum number of real zeros, that is the most points on the x-axis that can be zeros. So the maximum number of real zeros is the same as the degree, six. So that the maximum number of x-intercepts is also six, because the x-intercepts are made from the zeros. And the maximum number of turning points. Remember, those are the um, relative maximum points and relative minimum points. Is always one less than the degree. So it's going to be 6 minus 1, which is 5. And that's going to be true for polynomials, for all polynomials, all the time. Here the degree is 8. So the maximum number of real zeros that this polynomial can have is eight. And the maximum number of x-intercepts the graph can have is eight. And the maximum number of turning points is eight minus one which is seven. It's as simple as that. And again, here we have a function that's not quite written, written correctly, not written correctly, negative x to the third minus seven x the highest degree term should always come first. So now we see that the degree is three. Which means the maximum number of real zeros is three. And the maximum number of x-intercepts is three. And the maximum number of turning points is three minus one which is two. That's not hard, but it is so nice. Now, 
Now here we're supposed to choose the graph of this. And of course you can always just graph it on your graphing calculator, but there's actually an easier way. If you notice that the degree is five, which is odd, and the leading coefficient is negative, we know that that means that the end behavior is going to be up on the left and down on the right. And so the quickest way to choose a graph is to just look at the end behavior, okay? And, and see which one meets the end behavior. And if more than one of them have the same end behavior, which is the correct in behavior, then you can look at other things. So, the only graph that has the correct end behavior is D. So, I don't have to drag out a graphing calculator. I don't have to plug all kinds of stuff in. Um, all I have to do is say, well, this is the only one with the correct end behavior up on the left down on the right. So it's got to be this one. It could not be any of the others. And we talked about end behavior a lot yesterday. Just shout out if you have a question. Okay, now we have we have this, this polynomial, and it's already been factored for us, which is nice. So we could find the x-intercepts, <clears throat> but let's see if we can do this with the end behavior also. The leading term, there are gonna be maybe as many as five different terms in this polynomial, but the leading term is going to be x times x times x times x. So the LT, the leading term, is going to be x to the fourth. And since all of these x's have an understood positive one in front of them, this is going to be positive one x to the fourth. And then, uh, plus however many terms we have after this. So let's see, the end behavior of a fourth degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient is going to be up on the left, up on the right. So let's see, this is down on the left and down on the right. This is down on the left and up on the right. This is down on the left and up on the right. This is up on the left and up on the right. So we could find the x-intercepts. Uh, just by setting each factor equal to zero, and then checking carefully to make sure which, which ones have the right zeros, or we could check the end behavior first. This is the only, only graph with the end behavior that meets our needs. Then you can check the zeros. Um, our zeros are going to be x equals 0, x equals 3, x equals negative 2, and x equals 8. And yes, this does work. Negative 2, 0, 3, and 8. 
But since it's the only graph with the right end behavior, I didn't have to do that. So yeah, I know it's D. Again, somebody really likes the letter D. Two of them. Okay, so these are are quick ways so that you don't even have to really take the time to graph this in your graphing calculator. You can, but this really is quicker and easier. Discussions so far. Stuff, if you will, stuff that, that the leading term influences determines the maximum number of real zeros, the maximum number of x-intercepts, the maximum number of turning points, the end behavior. Yep. <laughs> so the leading term is very, very important. Just shout out if you have a question. OK, I told you today that we were going to learn a new method of factoring. And we are. This is a cubic. And if you work on this for a few minutes, or even if you just look at it, if you already are good at factoring by grouping, where you put parentheses around the first two terms, parentheses around the, the, the second two terms, you factor out a GCF, you factor out a GCF, let's do it. And then, what's in here matches what's in here, but it doesn't. And that's when the truth hits you. This is not factorable by a method that you know yet. What are we going to do? This is terrible. So I'm going to put a question mark there. Not factorable. Well, OK, here's the truth that you have never been told. And that is. All polynomials are factorable. Even this is factorable. I'll even circle it. It's just that it's going to take, oh, and this is totally unimportant, except that's how we found out it's not factorable by a method you already know. We're going to use a new method. So here's our third degree cubic polynomial. OK, and I'm going to put a one in front of here. And now I'm going to say this. I'm not the one who said it originally. I think it was Newton himself. If 
there are rational zeros. That is, those are the ones that behave well. Those are the ones we can find exactly on the x-intercept. I mean, on the x-axis. We love rational zeros. We love rational anything. We don't particularly love, let's see, we love numbers like one, two, three. We're willing to love zeros. I mean, zero, the number zero. Willing to love zero. And sort of like rationals, that is fractions. like one third or negative two sevenths. I mean, it's a matter of anything is better anything is better than um, the square root of 13 or negative 7i. So these are, are the rational numbers right here. The ones we love to sort of like. We call them the rationals. And they're better than the alternative. Okay, well, here is, here is the theorem right, right now. It's called the rational zeros theorem. Does it, well, And I'm going to write it in English, not in mathematicalese. If. Now that's a very important if. If a polynomial has rational zeros. So there's no guarantee. But if a polynomial has rational zeros, those rational zeros will be included in, or will be found in, those rational zeros can be found in what we call the set of P over Q numbers. Let's say that, P over Q numbers. Well, what the heck is that? That's why I'm so glad we have two days to do this. Well, the P numbers are the factors of the constant on the far right of the polynomial.
factors of the constant. And I'll say on the far right side of the polynomial. So in this case, our constant is negative 24. However, we don't worry about the sign. So we're going to look at 24 and take all the plus and minus factors of 24. Okay, well, let's look at what the factors are. We've got one times 24 and two times 12 and three times eight and four times six and then they start to repeat. I mean, to you turn them around, not five, but six times four, and then eight times three. Yeah, so. And so I can write these in order because life will be easier if I write them in order. And I'm going to make a set out of them by writing them in set notation. That is with these little squigglies called braces. So how about one, two, three, four, six, eight, twelve, and twenty-four? And those are going to be plus and minus. That's what the P numbers are for this problem. The Q numbers are the factors of the leading coefficient. the number at the front of the leading term, which in this case is a one. A plus or minus one. Because we always take the plus or the minus. And so the P over Q, that is, if this polynomial has rational coefficient, well, no, if this polynomial has rational zeros, then what they're going to be is all possible I have to keep reminding myself there is no hurry. All possible rational zeros are going to be the P's over the Q's. That is plus or minus one, two, three, four, six, eight, forget what they are, 
8, 12, and 24. All of them over all the factors of the leading coefficient, which in this case is just one. Well, you know what a number over one is. It's just itself. So what that means is that all the possible rational zeros of this polynomial Okay, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus four, plus or minus six, plus or minus eight, plus or minus twelve, plus or minus twenty four. Now you take all of these and put them over plus or minus one, you just get what you started with. So these are like a bowl full of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sixteen numbers, sixteen possible numbers, all of which could be the zeros of the function if the zeros are rational, or at least some of them are rational, they'll be found among these numbers. So now, remembering that zeros make x-intercepts when the zeros are real, let's go check the graph, which I already made for you, because I'm wonderful, yes, it's true. Okay, this is one, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six. Are all of those numbers in the list? Positive one, negative four, negative six, yes. Does that mean they are? Probably they are, but we still have to prove it. All right, I mean, this could be 6.0000, negative 6.0000001, and this could be <clears throat> negative 3.999999999. You just don't know. OK, so we have to check. But what I have to do first is. Um, add a page. There. See, because I already had a page waiting for us. The next one won't take this much time because I've already talked through it. But here are the numbers we have to check. Now, when I was a girl, there were no graphing calculators. OK, we had to check. We had a mean teacher. We had to check every single number. And then we discovered a, a rule called the, the law of sign changes that um, um, helped to cut down on the number that we had to check, but we still had to check an awful lot. Nowadays, with a graphing calculator, you don't have to check that many numbers. I am going to see if negative six, negative four, and positive one really are zeros of the function. Well, how can I do that? 
You know how to do that. I am going to copy this polynomial just so I don't have to rewrite it because I'd have to be jumping back and forth looking. There it is. There. Okay, what I need to do is this. I need to find F of each of those zeros. F of one, F of negative four, and F of, well, F of negative six. Those are my guesses for the rational zeros of that function based on, whoa, based on the graph. It helps, it really helps to graph these and guess. But of course it all depends on, are the numbers you're guessing in the bowl of all possibilities? So here we go. Now, why am I doing this? Why am I about to do this? And the answer is that the zeros of the function, zeros of f of x, make f of x equal zero. So if f of 1 equals 0, and if f of negative 4 equals 0, and if f of negative 6 equals 0, then yes, those are the zeros. So let's see. Well, f of 1 is going to be 1 times 1 to the third, plus 9 times 1 squared, plus 14 times 1, minus 24. Okay, well, so this is going to be 1 plus 9 is 10, plus 14 is 24, minus 24 is 0. So that one for sure, 1 is a 0 of the function, yay. Now for the others, I'm going to actually use the calculator. So one times negative four to the third power plus nine times negative four squared plus 14 times negative four minus 24. <gasps> Thank goodness, it's zero, yay. See? Okay, now we're gonna try negative six. Only I'm going to use the shortcut if I go second enter. I get to just go backwards. And pop a new number in there. My goal. Is to have a negative six instead of a negative four. And I'm less likely to make mistakes this way. So I have one times negative six to the third power plus 
9 times negative 6 squared plus 14 times negative 6 minus 24. And it's zero. Okay, so we found the zeros. Now we have to see what they want us to do with them. But for now, one, negative four, and negative six. Those are the zeros. What do they want? What do they want? Factor, factor the polynomial. Okay, we can do this. This is our new method of factoring. And there's a formula. F of X equals A, the leading coefficient, times X minus the first zero, times X minus the second zero, times X minus the third zero, since there are only three zeros. Well, okay, we can do this. The leading coefficient is one. So f of x equals one times x minus one. That's the first zero right there. Times x minus negative four times x minus negative six. Okay, we're gonna have to clean this up. F of x. When a is a one, it disappears, the way all understood ones disappear when they're multiplying something. So this is going to be x minus one, times x minus negative, well, that's a plus then, x plus four times x minus negative six, which is x plus six. And there we go. This is what you'll write in the answer box. Unless, of course, they want you to write f of x equals, but I think they write the f of x for you, and then you just write the factorization. Now, having gone to all this trouble, we're going to do it again with a similar, a similar kind of polynomial. Factor the polynomial. Well, if you spend any time at all trying to factor by grouping, you discover that you can't factor by grouping. We're going to have to use this new method called the rational zeros theorem. Or the R, R, Z, T. The rational zeros theorem. And what does that say? That says I have to use P over Q. to find the collection of all possible rational zeros, if there are any rational zeros. I don't know. Okay. 
So P is going to be all the factors, positive and negative, of 14. Well, there aren't very many of those, are there? P is going to equal plus or minus 1 times 14 and 2 times 7. So that'll be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 7, and plus or minus 14. Those are all my P's. Now my Q's just come from the leading coefficient, which is 1. So plus or minus 1. So P over Q, we're going to have the same thing happen. All of these numbers put over 1 are just going to be all those numbers. So plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 7, and plus or minus 14. Now let's look at the graph and see, let's make some educated guesses. And what I see here is negative one, positive two, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, positive seven. So my hypothesis 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 is that the zeros of f of x I suppose I should say the rational zeros. I guess I will. The rational zeros of f of x are negative 1 and 2 and 7. But I don't know that for sure. And that's so true. Never assume. No, we have to make sure that f of negative 1 equals 0, f of 2 equals 0, and f of 7 equals 0. If even one of them isn't a zero, like if two doesn't give us a zero, then we have to throw it out and assume, well, gee, that must be like 1.9 or something, or 2.01. All right, well, let's do this then. Clear. First, I need to, well, I need to just remember negative one, right? So, one times negative one to the third, one parentheses, negative one, raised to the third power, minus eight times parentheses, negative one, squared plus five times negative one plus 14. Remember when you're using the calculator, always, 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 always put negative numbers in parentheses or you'll get the wrong answer. Zero, yes, okay. So now I'm going to go, what am I going to do? I'm going to go second 
enter. And then I'm going to go back to each parentheses and put in a positive two. So delete two. See now all I have is a two there. I, I have to get rid of the negative, so I hit delete. And now the cursor is on top of one, so all I do is hit two. Delete the negative sign and then hit two. So then I go through and I just make absolutely certain one times two to the third minus eight times two squared plus five times two plus 14. Yes. Zero. Woo! And then seven. So I go second. Enter. I don't have to delete this time because this is a positive two. There's no sign in front of it. So on the two, I'll just hit a seven and it overwrites. Seven. And then I go through and make sure that I've got what I want. And I hold my breath. <gasps> Yay, okay, so these are the zeros. They really truly are the zeros of that function. So now what? Now I have to write this function in factored form. A, the leading coefficient is one. And I might as well let Z1 be negative one and Z2 be two and Z3 be seven. So we'll have F of X equals A times X minus Z1 times X minus Z2 times X minus Z3. And that will give me F of X equals one times X minus negative one times X minus positive two times X minus positive seven. All right, well, here's the only place I have a minus minus this time. So F of X equals, this is one times this. So this will be X plus one times X minus two times X minus seven. And now I've written f of x in factored form. And I have done this. So you notice there are steps. The first thing you do, once you're sure you can't just factor it by a method you already know, is you go ahead and you find your P over Q's so that you have your complete collection of all possible rational zeros. That doesn't mean they're all the answers. There's no way. But the numbers you decide are your answers have to be in this pool of possible zeros. 
Then you make your educated guess. Then you check each one to make sure that when you plug that zero in for X, this zero in for X, this zero in for X, that is your hypothesized zeros into X, you really do get zeros. If you get zeros, then these numbers are your zeros. That is confusing. And then you can write your, your polynomial here in factored form. Why write it in factored form? Aside from the fact that the instructions say to do it. In real life, it's so you can look, look at the polynomial in factored form and say, oh, I see what the zeros are. That means you see what the x-intercepts are. And the x-intercepts, remember, are very, 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 very important for lots of different reasons. Like in economics, they're the turnaround points for profit. Okay, we're going to learn something else now, too. We're going to take this and we're going to see how zeros actually build polynomials. And again, I'm reminding myself, I am not in a hurry. If you got here late, if anybody got here late, although I didn't hear them come in, um, um, yeah, never mind. You'll find out. I guess I should say it. I discovered that what we were supposed to do today is just a copy of what we did Monday and Tuesday and a little bit on Thursday, which is really annoying to me. So we're going to spend two days on this because this is really important to what you're going to do. All right, so zeros build polynomials. Like these three zeros, we're told that these are zeros of a polynomial function of degree three. Well, okay. And that polynomial has real coefficients. And these are the zeros. Real coefficients means it hasn't got any I numbers in front of the, <clears throat> in front of the variables. Okay, well, we're going to use this formula to actually build the polynomial. You start with the zeros and then you build the polynomial. A is the leading coefficient, but it's always assumed with these problems that A is going to be one. So the polynomial we're going to build, excuse me, is going to be, I'll write this once, and then I don't have to write it again when it's a one. I'm going to let negative two be Z1, three be Z2, and negative four BZ three. You could use a different order if you want to. X minus negative two, X minus positive three, 
x minus negative 4. So f of x is going to equal 1 times x plus 2 times x minus 3 times x plus 4. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take any two of these. Like how about these two? You can make your own choices. So I'll have x plus 2 times x times x is x squared, x times plus 4 is plus 4x. Negative 3 times x is minus 3x, and negative 3 times positive 4 is minus 12. Now don't jump to um, start multiplying again. We have two like terms that we need to combine before we do that. So I will have x plus 2 times x squared 4x minus 3x is plus 1x minus 12. And the only reason I put the 1 there is that I know I'm going to be multiplying. Um, I don't need it, do I? Shouldn't have bothered. There. Okay. Now I'm ready to start multiplying again. I'm going to take this x and multiply it by x squared plus x minus 12. And then I'm going to take the plus 2 and multiply it by x squared plus x minus 12. So here we go. X squared times X is X to the third. X times X, it, X times plus X is plus X squared. And X times minus 12 is minus 12 X. Now I've got the plus two times X squared is plus 2x squared plus 2 times plus x is plus 2x and plus 2 times minus 12 is minus 24. So let's see. We're going to have x to the third plus x squared plus 2x squared is plus 3x squared. And minus 12x plus 2x is minus 10x. And then there aren't any constant terms except this one. So this is the polynomial built by these three zeros. Could there be other possibilities? Yes, if I were to change A, if 
if for some reason A became two, then I would have two times all this, I'd have to multiply in the two. If A became negative five, I'd have to multiply in negative five. So um, this is the polynomial I get when I assume that A, the leading coefficient A is one. Okay, notice you have to go step by step. Be very, very careful. It's really easy to make a silly mistake. And then get really mad at yourself. Now this is how rational zeros build a polynomial. They're the easy ones. We should do at least one hard one, harder one, before we go. Now this says, write a polynomial function in standard form with real coefficients whose zeros include two, which is rational, five i, which is complex, and negative five i, which is also complex. And in fact, these are complex conjugates, which will always occur together when you've got real coefficients. Complex conjugates. If you were going, you don't have to, but if you were going to write these in A plus BI form, you would have zero plus five I and zero minus 5i. That's why they're conjugates. We're going to take advantage of that, that fact, in just a minute. Because we have to build a polynomial in which a is 1, from these three zeros, one rational zero and two complex conjugate zeros. So Z1 equals two, Z2 equals five I, and Z3 equals negative 5i. And f of x, when a equals 1, is going to be x minus z1 times x minus z2 times x minus z3. So here's what we're going to have. We're going to have x minus 2 times x minus 5i times x minus negative 5i. Clean it up x minus 2 times x minus 5i times x plus 5i. 
because minus minus is plus. Okay, then I'm going to take these two factors and multiply them together while this poor little factor stands by and does nothing. X times X is X squared. X times plus five I is plus five I times X. Negative five I times X is minus five I X. And negative five I times positive five I is negative or minus rather 25 I squared. OK, that's our first pass. Now we're going to go again. X squared. Now what we've got here is 5 I X minus 5ix, that's zero. When you, when you subtract something from itself, you get zero. All right, and minus 25, remember that i squared equals negative one. And this is the primary reason you have to remember that. All right, and so we're going to be left with x squared minus 25 times negative 1 is plus 25. Now we're going to multiply these and be done for the day. X times X squared plus 25 minus two times X squared plus 25. equals x to the third plus 25 x minus 2 x squared minus 50. Almost done. We have to write polynomials in descending order. So this is going to be x to the third minus 2x squared plus 25x minus 50. And that is the polynomial that is built from these three zeros. Now this was the only really stressful thing, I think. The P's over Q, they're new, but they're not really hard. And the concept is new. The new way of factoring is new. But this wasn't overly difficult. On the other hand, I do agree with you if you're thinking that this was kind of difficult, but not really. Tomorrow, we'll review all this that we did today, go over it, and then 
we'll finish up with some hard stuff like this. Here are your three zeros. Z1 is five plus the square root of seven. That's a typical irrational number. And it's conjugate. Five minus the square root of seven. And then four, which is rational. And there's a, a kind of a special way that you have to multiply in order to make this easier. We'll learn that too. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time on this problem. And then you would think that actually this is the only one that's going to be time consuming and difficult. You'll be glad to know. But go back over these concepts today about how the zeros and the x-intercepts relate and how the zeros build a polynomial when you put them in the um, in this formula, the, the factor formula. We actually learned quite a bit today. Even this, that's so easy, you still have to memorize it. Although it's not difficult at all. Yeah, those first three problems are not difficult at all. And neither are these graphing tricks. When all you have to do is choose a graph. Now, if you had to make the graph, that would be different. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Work on this and feel free to send your questions to me. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.